everyone. Welcome this Friday afternoon. My name is Raymond Payne. I'm a member of the philosophy department here at PC and the director of the Humanities Forum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the first forum event this semester, especially to those of you who are freshmen and coming for the first time. The Humanities Forum exists to provide a regular space, typically every Friday afternoon or most Fridays during the semester, for the entire campus to come together and think about important topics in the humanities. Please take a look at our schedule for the semester if you haven't seen it yet. We have some musical events, we have additional speakers, we have a film we're screening at the end of October. It'd be great to see you all again. As a part of the forum, we regularly hold receptions after our events where we can continue the conversation. Please join us for that afterwards. It'll be in the great room just down the hall. We have plenty of food for everyone, and it'd be great to see you there to join us. Please uh, welcome now uh, Dr. Sandra Keating, who will introduce our speaker this afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Everyone's here on your first Friday afternoon of a long weekend. It's nice to see so many students here. Um, I'm Dr. Sandra Keating of the Theology Department. And I see some of my students here. Uh, if you are here um, getting extra credit or because your professors um, wanted you to be here, make sure that you check in or send them an email. And we can always uh, verify that if you need that. Um, today we are very, very happy to welcome as our first speaker, uh, Dr. Mark Smith, uh, who is an expert in Hebrew Bible. He is currently at, uh, uh, the Helena Professor of Old Testament Literature and Exegesis at Princeton Theological Seminary, where he moved after uh, coming from uh, New York University, where he was a professor in the Hebrew and Judaic Studies Department. Um, he has had many, many honors and uh, fellowships, um, appointments, et cetera, but a few that um, uh, stand out for us are the Lady Davis Visiting Professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem uh, in the Albright Institute for Archaeological Research. Uh, he was also a visiting scholar uh, in Madrid um, in, uh, in the year 2008. Uh, he got his PhD at, the, at Yale University, wrote his dissertation on Kothar Wahasis, the Ugaritic craftsman god, uh, and um, his expertise, <laughs> I don't know if you've, uh, not many people uh, hear about their dissertation uh, um, long after they've written it. We always often hope that uh, people remember our dissertations, so I like to uh, mention dissertations. Um, uh, and um, in his expertise in Ugaritic as well. Um, he has written many, many books, articles, uh, monographs, uh, articles and books with other people. Uh, most recently and importantly for us uh, in the, um, is the Psalms, the Divine Journey, and the Early History of God, Yahweh, and Other Deities in Ancient Israel. Today his topic is, going to, is entitled Historiographies of Judges, Thoughts on Reading for Readers of the Bible, and we welcome um, Dr. Mark Smith, thank you. Well, thank you. I hope this microphone is working OK. Can you hear me in the back there? OK, terrific. So I want to welcome all of you who you're, you're, you're just dying to hear about the book of Judges. I can't believe that there's so many people here who are interested in this. And I'm really grateful to be here. I just want to add a couple of details. You might think that dissertation term was like the most obscure thing you ever heard. The word Kothar, remember the name of that craftsman god, is actually etymologically related to the word kosher in Hebrew, like keeping kosher. And it's a long etymological journey that I'm not going to tell you about today. <laughs> the second thing is that one of the most important fellowships I ever held was at was when I wrote my dissertation in 1983 to 84 at the Albright Institute in Jerusalem. And it is a wonderful place to work. All kinds of archaeologists and experts in language and Bible and so on come from all across the United States, Canada, Europe, China, and they all meet there in really the center of where it all began for people who do what I do and for people who believe in Christian, Jewish, and Muslim tradition. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be able to share some of what uh, I've been doing, working on pretty hard for the last 10 years. 
Think about where you were 10 years ago. I don't want to hear the answer. I started working on a commentary on the book of Judges exactly 10 years ago. It's going to be a two-volume work. First volume only covers the first 10 chapters. So that's almost one year per chapter of my life has gone to this commentary. That's crazy. Who does that anymore? But here I am. Um, so judges. So what we're going to do is we're going to sort of step back and to the beginning a little bit, rather than jumping right into this, this kind of funny word historiography. So first of all, judges. I, I'm, uh, what do you think of when you think of judges? Do you think of anything? And if the answer is no, that's fine. Does, has that, first of all, has anyone ever read the book of Judges? OK, so a few of you have read it. The, those of you who haven't read it, do you know anything about it? And if the answer is no, it's OK with me. I want honest answers, not pretend answers. Know anything about Judges? Anybody who's in Judges? I bet you do. Deborah. OK, no faculty. OK, come on. Is this really for you? OK, yes, it is, too. OK, so Deborah. Anybody else? Samson. This is the one. Samson and Delilah. Anyway, so yes, there's a, there's a judge anybody could love, right? Or probably did um, in antiquity. Uh, anybody else? Gideon, after all, you got to, how ironic. Any Gideon Bible have the book of Judges in it? No. Well, it's mostly New Testament when you get a Gideon's Bible, but not always, I suppose. But I've always found that a bit ironic. OK, Gideon. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on, how about Shamgar? He only gets one and a half verses devoted to him. Who could ever forget him? Actually, he's a colorful figure. He slays, he slays all these Philistines. We don't even know who he is, though. He's kind of a mystery figure. We don't know what tribe. He's the only so-called judge we don't know what tribe he's from. Look at that handout. You see that list of handout with the tribes and the judges? It's on. The bottom, oh, sorry, that was way too loud. Under number three on page one, he's the only one who doesn't have a tribal affiliation. All the others have a tribal affiliation. So you'll see now the rest of the, the missing answers to my question. That is, the other judges who are in the book of Judges, you see there from the list right there. OK? Um, if you had to open. If you had to open a Bible and find this thing, where would you find it? Where does it appear? Either what appears before it or after it. Any idea where you might find it? I mean, uh, Costco? No, I don't think so. Um, well, actually, you might find Bibles on sale at Costco. I never look. Uh, that's not where I usually go to look for my Bibles for sale. Um, any idea where it appears in the Bible? Is it in the New Testament? Well, thank you. Thank you. You gave me something there, Lottie. So uh, it's in the Old Testament. OK. What part of the Old Testament is it in? Hmm. You're close. You're getting so close. So close, and yet so far. Um, sorry. Um, so you got this idea. So when you actually, your king's answer is a terrific answer for reasons that I hope to get to a little bit later. As a matter of fact, I'm not just making that up. Um, so it's in. So when you you got judges and kings, what other books kind of go with judges and kings? Or to rephrase, after you have the Pentateuch or Torah, the first five books of the Bible, which are Genesis and and then what's next? Exodus, and then Leviticus. Bam! OK, you've been listening or reading or something. And what comes after Leviticus? It, oh, ooh, you, you've learned. That's an excellent question. 
That's the one that you don't want to have to answer in class. That's an excellent question. Yes, that's true. It is an excellent question. What comes after Leviticus? Anybody? Leviticus, Numbers, and then? And then? Bam. And then? Right answer. If you don't know, that's the right answer. Bam. And after Joshua is? Judges. <laughs> I know that was a really loaded question, wasn't it? So what we've got is that Joshua judges 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. It's the basic order. In many Bibles, Ruth comes right after, comes right after Judges. In some traditions, it doesn't. In Jewish tradition, it doesn't. But it does in many Christian Bibles. Now, let's think about that for a moment. What difference does it make? So, so for those of you who maybe have read Judges, like Macrish here. Oh, Father Macrish, sorry. Father. Um, what difference does it make whether Samuel follows Judges or Ruth follows Judges? Now, we usually just take these names as kind of objective labels somehow. And I'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. What difference does it make if you're reading Ruth after Judges or you're reading Samuel? Now, you, it kind of means you have to know what's in these books. So think about Ruth. Ruth begins in the days that Judges judged. So it's set in the time of Judges. And it's this gorgeous, wonderful story that begins with this poignant, poignant relationship between Ruth and really her former mother-in-law, because her husband has died. She's no longer familially, legally related. And Ruth tells her mother-in-law, former mother-in-law, because her husband's died. Her mother-in-law says, I'm going to go back home to Bethlehem. And Ruth says, where you go, I will go. Your people shall be my people, and your people shall be my God. And what she's proposing there is to be kin with her. That's language of kinship. Your people, my people. Your house, my house. And your God, my God, means even though I'm not related to you to anymore, I'm going to be related to you. It's a form. This is language of covenant between people. David and Jonathan have one. They're not related by blood, but they make a covenant with one another. And what Ruth does is she makes a covenant with her mother-in-law. Go back to Bethlehem, the story works out, she remarries, they have children. At the end of chapter 4, then, we're given the genealogy of Ruth, which ends with the figure of David. It's kind of a prophecy toward gesturing toward the monarchy. It's all in the days of Judges. Book of Samuel, so you might say it's the alternative after book. Why does it matter? Samuel's the whole story of the rise of um, Samuel's a new leader, provides guidance to the people. We haven't had that since Joshua, all the time from before Judges. All that time we haven't had a figure like a Moses, a Joshua, or a Samuel. Now we've got Samuel, and eventually Samuel will be Leadership we'll see emerging at the end of Samuel with the figure of David, great high point. So what's, why does it matter? What Ruth tells you, because it's set in the time of Judges, is that the Judges period wasn't all bad. Judges had this wonderful story, also gesturing toward the monarchy, which Samuel also does. They both gesture toward the monarchy. Samuel is saying, yeah, it really was bad. Because you had no leadership like Moses, Joshua, or Samuel. Judges was an awful period. So the orders of the book are part of the message of the book. And we don't even think about that. We just read from one book to the next without thinking about, well, why would you have different orders? You s people often will pose that question, well, which one's the right order? Well, theologically, Neither one is more right than the other. They're both telling us wonderful messages for different reasons. 
that God's grace was fully operative in the book of Judges would have been available to Israel, and the book of Ruth proves that. Samuel is saying that period was not such a great period. It, they were disobedient, and only until we see Samuel are, is leadership going to be okay again in ancient Israel. So order matters. Even the name Judges, how do you name biblical books? I mean, I don't do it much for a living. I don't name biblical books. I help name my kids, but not biblical books. Actually, they're all named after biblical figures, so it's not so. So how do they name biblical books? Well, you have two different things going on. If you, biblical books in English are named for, at, they, those names come from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And they do it on the basic of a perceived topic. Genesis, it's the beginning of everything. Exodus, we're getting out of Egypt. Leviticus, which is a word everyone uses all the time today in English, Leviticus, is just a fancy word for priestly stuff. Levites in the Bible are priests. Numbers is because we've got a census right at the beginning in chapter 1, and then another one in chapter 26. It's the census of the people as they start to move away from Mount Sinai on their journey to the Promised Land in Deuteronomy. And you know that sounds like Greek. It literally means second law, nomos, law, deutero, like deuterocanonical books, also a nice biblical term, secondary canonical books, is the reiteration. It's like the whole retelling. They're no longer at Mount Sinai. They're poised to join, to cross into the promised land. And Moses tells them the whole thing again. And so Deuteronomy is a kind of resume with changes and with a, another vision of what that law is going to look like that was given at Mount Sinai to the next generation. So all these names come. And judges, well, where does judges come from? Well, you might say it's the topic of the book. That is, beginning in chapter 3 and running completely through chapter 16, as the handout will show you in, on page 1 under number 2. It gives you kind of the organization. From chapter 3 on through the end of chapter 16 are, is a succession of judges. Okay, and we could go through other biblical books, but... Let me turn to the other side of the issue about names of biblical books. And this is a fun thing to know. I always, I always like to know what other traditions are doing in terms of naming biblical books or biblical knowledge generally. And in Jewish tradition, the way traditionally you name a biblical book, it, first of all, it's going to come from Hebrew. And it's often a major word that's the first word or second or third word in the whole book. So Genesis, is, is it almost sounds like the same thing in Hebrew, because what's the first word in Genesis? Bam! So you could say that would be the English name. That is, Hebrew is Breshit, in the beginning. And Exodus, what's Exodus called? No idea. Why would you know? Shmot which means names, because the second word of the book, the book begins, these are the names, etc. And it gives you a little list of all the names. And it keeps going like that. Well, we get down to the book of Judges, and you look in the first chapter, you won't find the word Judges. Most people don't even realize, even most biblical scholars don't notice, it doesn't occur until chapter 2, verse 16. And it occurs in chapter 2, verse 16. And then there's the form with the suffix in chapter 2, verse 17. And then the word judges again in chapter 2, verse 18. And then the plural form never occurs again. So Jewish tradition doesn't take it from the very beginning of the book, which has always been kind of a mystery to me. It's one of the, there's another book that does that, and that's Kings. The word Kings in the plural doesn't occur at the beginning of Kings. And these are also the only two books of the Old Testament that I know of that are named for a social collective or socio-political collective, not for, not for, you know, a topic 
or for an, a person's name, like all the major prophets. You know what those names are because that's, it's the name of the prophet, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, etc. So you know them. But judges and kings are the only ones named for collectives. You get to Maccabees, which is part of the Catholic canon, not Jewish canon or Protestant canon, but first and second Maccabees are, is in the Bible for Catholics. And of course, Acts of the Apostles would be perhaps the closest New Testament analog. Normally, we're going to name them after a person. Or in Paul's case, you can't just name it after Paul because he's got a whole bunch of stuff going on there, so it's his letter to this community or that community. But generally, this is a rare thing. So actually, whoever wrote Judges, and this goes back to your brilliant response to my earlier question, which is Judges and Kings were, were designed to help build out a large, what we'll call, I'm going to call it this fancy schmancy word that I chose in my title, the historiographical arc that runs from Joshua through Kings. And basically, whoever put this whole thing together, so when I look at historiography, I'm trying to look for the big picture. When I look at an individual passage, don't worry, I do what all those biblical scholars do. I analyze them to death and pick them apart, and I can give you the theories of how they all went together and all this sort of thing. But at some point, it's valuable to step back and ask, what does the big picture look like? And one of the things that I like about the word historiography, which I'm going to say a little bit more about, is that historiography is the way, uh, basic definition, the way historians put their history together. History is, you might say, the written account of the past, but historiography is looking at how each historian did that. That is, the same historian could sit down and write an account of that history as another historian could. Are they going to look exactly the same? No. Why? Why, if it's objective history, say, well, they're not objective. I mean, who is 100% objective? Some people might ask. But different people have different conceptualizations of how they view the past. Whether they know it or not, we're all operating with a whole lot of mental equipment. And being in university is a partially about discovering what your own mental equipment is about and how to stretch it and make it deeper, longer, better so that you become the person you can become and are becoming. And university is great about that task, about the ways you can do that, whether you're a visual learner, you're an oral learner, you develop. The whole point is getting toward a mature, as mature, the best version of how you can learn to teach yourself after you leave this place. And so, Looking at what, go back, what historians are doing, they look, at, they look at ancient histories. And we might say, well, Judges is kind of in a part of the Bible that traditionally Christians have called the historical books of the Bible. OK, okay that's, which is, that is, there's a written version of the past. But they also do it according to different ways that they understand what that past is about. And part of that big part of what it's about so I'm going to start big and then move in a little bit, is that Joshua is telling you how God fulfilled God's promises to Israel upon entry into the land as offered in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy says that if you keep my, my laws and my rules and, my, and your devotion to me, then I will give you this land, and this land will give you its plenty. It's like a deal. It's kind of like a covenant, because it is a covenant. And what Joshua is saying, as a book, God gives a, a great leader, successor to Moses. It's very explicit about that. Deuteronomy and, and Joshua together. And that Joshua did, for his phase of history, each book almost is like a phase of history. And that Joshua phase is is 
big credit to the Lord your God who is bringing you to the land that he will give to you. You get the judges, and the, the, the basic point of judges is, well, how do you think it's going in the book of Judges? Do you, now, I didn't really call on, put those hands back up of those people who've read the book of Judges. Let's see those hands. Come on. Oh, yeah, now you really want to put them up, right? Okay, so what's that progression look like in the book of Judges? And how do you know what that, pro I mean, what would you say is the progression overall? I mean, I've got 20 pages written on it sitting on the podium, but I'd rather ask you. What do you think? You've read the book? What kind of, what, what, what's your takeaway from the book of Judges as a whole? Let me put it that way. Yes, sir. How do you know that? <laughs> hey, 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 hey. <laughs> That's not going to get you through that doctoral program. I've read someone who says that somewhere. Can you tell me? Well, I don't quite remember, but anyway. So if you look at your handout, page one, under number two. So what it tells you is that there's a kind of organization to the book. Oh, my gracious. Sit down, sit down, sit down. So, there's a, so it actually, there's a, there's a structure to this book, which I've laid out on page two, under number two. There's a prologue that runs from 1-1 one, one to about 2-10, depending on how you view it. And then you finally get to, you get an introductory section for what follows. Um, you see where I'm looking at? I'm at page two. Let's look at this handout together, please. Look at your handout. And under page two, under, I mean page one, number two. Go back to page one. I'm sorry about that. And uh, you'll see there it says prologue, right? And so that, there's no judges in the prologue. No judges in the prologue. And then, and then what you get is what I call panel one, two, and three. How you doing? Good. And under there is the answer to my question that I just was trying to respond over here because the exact theme as named before it, how do we know what's the book about? How the cycle of sin is because panels, each panel, as I call it, begins with an introduction. And that introduction, the language of each of those introductions is very similar, especially the first and the third. And they want to tell you this is what the book means, this is what their lives meant ultimately. That it has what we would call, if we were reading a Roman historian or some other historian, it would be a what kind of idea of history? A, a what, what? Or for us, even today, what would, what's the th idea or theory of history that's implied by this? We would call this a cyclical view of history. Over and over again, the same kind of thing happens. You hear about economic cycles. It's a cyclical view of the history of the economy. You used to hear about political or social cycles. We go through this, and then well, the pendulum swings back. It's just another version of a cyclical view of history. And some people actually find that incredibly appealing as a view of history. There are strong versions of that kind of history. There are weaker views of it. But actually, it's still very much part of our discourse, even though we don't think about it. This one, this example, cyclical view of history, is a religious vision. The Israelites did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so the Lord sent, you fill in the blank with the name of the enemy, the enemy oppressed them for X number of years. They cried out to the Lord. This is the cycle of history. They cried out to the Lord because of their oppression, and the Lord sent them what they call a judge. Sometimes they call him a savior. Now, savior, we think of savior, we've got some big religious overtones with that as well we should. The basic meaning of the word savior in Hebrew as it's being used here all of our religious language comes from a human metaphor or from nature. 
write that down. You don't have to agree with me. And I go, I'll go to the mat with you about it, and that would be fun. But basically, all religious language in the Bible, Hebrew Bible, I'm not, gonna, I'm not a New Testament scholar. I don't even play one on TV. All religious language in the Hebrew Bible derives from human or social contexts. So nature imagery, I, I meant hum, human, that is social, plus nature. Human plus nature. And that's because it's a lived experience. Religion is not disembedded from the rest of experience in ancient Israel. So what they, so their notion of how God is for them, when they say Savior, Savior is being modeled on military leadership. A Savior is somebody who can rescue you from your enemy. It's like redemption. Redemption, that's a great religious term. What is redemp where does that word come from? At least in Hebrew, the word actually comes from the economic sphere. This is why God redeemed you from the land of Egypt because you were slaves, which is an economic matter to be redeemed from slavery. So these metaphors that we use for God ex very, very commonly come out of the human realm or the realm of nature. I haven't even gone into the whole idea that God is like sometimes depicted like with thunder and lightning. I mean, that's weather. I'd like to see a weather report for some of the stuff in the Hebrew Bible, you know, on you know, news. Yeah, I mean, oh, God's coming in about 30,000 tonight. And uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> fasten your seatbelts. Okay, so, so what the introduction to panel one is, it tells you that there's a cyclical history. And this is also very much in the panel number three. And the panel number two is kind of a modification of that. But each one is telling you that the stories that follow fit into this paradigm. If you read any one of these stories separately, by definition, you wouldn't know that it was a cycle. Because cycles depend on repetition. And in fact, most biblical scholars would argue that the bulk of these stories that are inside this structure were not written together originally. So it wasn't originally conceived of as a cycle of sin. So it means that there's more than one historiography in the same text. Write that down. There's more than one idea of history. There's more than one way of representing history, even in the same text as the Bible. It's a little difficult because we tend to have an idea that, it should, that the Bible, because it's from ultimately one from God should have a certain uniformity about it. But that's our, that, that latter part of that statement is our assumption. It wasn't God's assumption. Our biblical books are every bit as complex as the human processes of, of any production in life. It's complicated, and that's fine. If God didn't want it to be complicated, God wouldn't let it be complicated. And we need to accept what God gives us. Otherwise, I would say it's idolatrous. But that's me. OK, so we've got more than one view of history. That is, if you took the core stories themselves, some of them would just sort of show you, I've got this great collection of really interesting characters. There's no, there's, if you took the core story of, of, of Deborah, for example, in Judges 4 and 5, it's got two chapters. One is a prose narrative. It's got a piece of poetry attached to it. The only poetry in the book, really, I mean, there's maybe a snippet here or there. But basically, it's the only poem in the book. And that's an interesting little footnote. Most of these books, they almost all prose. Write this down. Joshua through Kings, this big historical books, are almost 90, I never really I'm making this number up, 95% or more prose. So poems are put in, 
particular places. And they're designed, they have a literary function, and the literary function is to tell readers, wow, we're going to stop for a poem to tell you how important and wonderful this event was. You get them at the end of Moses' life, at the end of Deuteronomy, you get two of them. Price is right, two for the price of one. You get two at the end of Samuel with the end of David's life. So sometimes they're put at the, at the ends of what we would call major stages of the history or phases. So it means you can use poetry almost like marking the table of contents, the end of a major section. And occasionally they'll also have a poem where they want to highlight it. They want you to say, stop and recognize the glory of God. And the Song of Deborah in chapter 5 is absolutely one of these places where God's victory in battle is being highlighted to the hilt. Pun intended. That's actually the Ehud story. Anyway, sorry. So what it means then is one of the techniques of writing history isn't simply, oh, I'm going to sit down and try to tell it the most objectively, objective way possible. This history is not only to tell the truth about the past. Write this down. It's to celebrate the past. And the poem is telling you to celebrate it very explicitly. And by being part of the audience for the poem, you're to sing. It's a hymn. It's a hymn to God. So history's purposes, write this down, the, his, the purposes of writing ancient history varies. It isn't simply, we have this idea, history is about trying to give an accurate version of the past. I don't really completely dispute that. I wouldn't, but there's a lot of other things going on about ancient histories. And these include religious purposes. Well, we already heard that. The cycle is a religious vision of the past. But so is the poem, which doesn't know the cycle. There's no reference to the cycle of sin and so on within Judges 4 and 5, except at the very intro where they want you to they put that to war remind you, yeah, that's what the overarching thing is about. But once you get into the story, there's none of that. It's all positive all the time in Judges 4 and 5 after that little intro verse or two. So even within the same book, not only do you have different historical purposes or viewpoints about what the history is about, you have different ways of how to do it. You can put that poem in with that prose, or you don't put that poem in with that prose. Not a lot of, you know, not, not, you know you're reading the, the history of the 20th century in the United States. How many poems do you get? And, oh, the author breaks, oh, sing to the Lord, or sing to whomever. But that's what, so it's a different kind of cultural project. So that's the next point. Different histories represent different kinds of, historic, uh, of cultural projects. They're not all about, I mean, we have this general notion, which is OK as a starting point, but it's very limiting that at least when it came to ancient history, it was about getting the past down right. It was about a lot of other things. I could tell you, but let's see, I want to watch this thing. Oh, yeah, there you are. We're talking about eight minutes. So. The idea of history in the book of Judges, turn to page two of your handout, please. We've already seen, to some degree, under number five, the idea, where did this idea of history, the cycle of history, the ingredients for it came from, the ingredients, the basic word and language, comes from the book of Deuteronomy. The interesting thing, I already told you that Joshua is the fulfillment of the book of Deuteronomy, that if you, that God will bring you into the land, and God's kept God's promises in the book of Joshua. But Deuteronomy also tells you, you have to keep the covenant. And in a sense, we may say 
that what the author of these introductions are telling you, not the guts of the stories, but each, the introduction for each panel, as I've called it, each group of stories of judges, tells you that where God did his part in Joshua, the people didn't do their part in Judges. Joshua and Judges really do go together. And they lift the language. And I gave one example here under number five from chapter two, from the panel in chapter two, from verses this piece. It's just a small part of it, 212 to 215. And Judges is mirrored phrase by phrase in chapter 29 that tells you bad things are going to happen to you if you don't do, if you don't keep the covenant. So it suggests that the book of Deuteronomy is not only just inspiring the vision in Joshua, but also at least for these introductions in the book of Judges. So they're a pair. But here's the funny part, for me anyway. I got so used to hearing biblical scholars tell me that all this stuff comes out of Deuteronomy. That Deuteronomy, it's got all the language, all the ideas, all the worldview, that they never told me that the whole idea of the cycle is not in the book of Deuteronomy. That's the innovator, that there's innovation within tradition. Deuteronomy is like, it's, it's, it's like, it's for, for some of the tradition in ancient Israel, it's like, it is the Bible, virtually. Whoever writes Joshua and writes these introductions to judges and puts together Samuel and Kings, Deuteronomy is the core charter document of the whole thing. In fact, so much so that scholars started talking about Joshua, Judges, 1 and 2 Samuel, and 1 and 2 Kings as the Deuteronomistic history. What a wonderful adjective. Don't you want to start using that? I love that adjective. It's almost as good as historiographical. But the point about it was right, that the influence of Deuteronomy could be felt, the footprint there was there, but what Bible scholars who often invoked this idea tended to miss what each book adds to that vision from Deuteronomy. And what our author in these introductions these, to these panels, as I've called them, they add the idea of the cyclical history. And where did they get the idea of the cyclical history that sometimes it could be good or might not be so good? is they got it from kings. Kings, if you read kings, every single one of them says the same thing, like in chapter 2 of Judges, which is, this king did evil in the eyes of the Lord. There are only like three or four kings in the whole bunch, over all those hundreds of years, who didn't do evil in the eyes of the Lord. Most of the time they did, like the people mostly did, from the point of view of that introduction. And I actually think, you don't have to believe me about this, by the way. This is more speculative than some of the other things I've said. I didn't say they weren't somewhat speculative. I just said, I actually think that whoever puts the book of Judges together, who's got the vision of Deuteronomy in his head, but also has developed the paradigm of what does that Deuter Deuteronomy idea look like, this idea of a succession of figures one after the next, and they are the leadership. And then we find out that some of them are called, most of them are called, did wrong in the eyes of the Lord. It's right out of Kings. And in fact, if you go hunting, and I know you're going to want to do this as soon as you get home. When you go hunting for the word judges, as in the book of Judges, from outside of the book of Judges, you will find that when they refer to the judges in a couple places, in Samuel and Kings, because we're in these books that are inflected by Deuteronomy language, how do they always refer to the judges? It's kind of like Ruth. It's always in reference to kings. It's judges and kings. Or it's judges before you, O David, in 2 Samuel 7, chapter, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 11. And it also appears, and then Judges and Kings appears together in 2 Kings 23. It's actually on the last page of your handout, so you don't have to write these down. So historiography 
it's, it's even the most simple looking things that you read in the Bible about their vision of the past and what does it mean and how did it happen, even the simplest things like labels, which we think are objective and they don't come from anywhere, they just are. But every, write this down, every label that we use, I don't care if it's Hebrew, I don't care if it's Greek, I don't care if it's English, it has a history. And that history has a point of view. Every single one. And you may not know it, and that's the insidious part. The insidious part, when we use labels and titles for things, we just, oh, that's just what it is. And so we feel like it's objective. Eh, 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 not happening. I know that's going to really play well on that tape. So these are all the stuff of historiography in the book of Judges. I actually do think that there probably was, I mean, I keep talking about these introductions to these various panels, and if you look within the individual stories, that they didn't have this vision of history. There's actually an in-between stage. You had, an, you had individual stories that people just loved because they were fun. I mean, what could be more fun than Samson? Or what could be more fun than when Ehud, the judge we've never talked about, who's a sneaky guy, being oppressed by the king of the Moabites, whose name is Eglon, whose name basically means like fatted calf. And by God, if he doesn't, he's, he's a Benjaminite, which means he's, he's a left-hander. And they, left-handedness is not com it's so common in antiquity. And he has got strapped right there a blade that's probably about 18 inches, but maybe shorter. It's got a, it's got a word for the length of that blade that doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible. A gomade. Yeah, I know you heard of it. Not so. And by God, if if Eglon is sitting up in his chamber, and Ehud whips that thing out, and he says, "Oh, before he does, he says, I have a secret." Oh yeah. Well, who doesn't like a good secret? And kings are always trying to collect information. That's like very important. And I have a secret for you, O oh, king. And he sure does. And he puts that secret right in his belly. And he kills him right there like a fatted calf, right there and then. And then it gets even worse, because not only is he like, he's, he's described as this big fat guy who's now got this, but then we get the description of what comes out. And the servants come to the door, and he's taking so long to come out. Meanwhile, our hero has gotten himself out of the palace, and they don't, and they, what's going on? And, and they wait for what the text says is an embarrassingly long time. It's a double translation. And, and because they can, and finally they unlock the thing, and there he is, dead on the floor, like a fatted calf. So these are great individuals. Why, why do you tell that? Because the Benjaminites, these poor little tribe that he comes, the hero comes from, tells a story about these big bad Moabites who live across the river. So it was like tribal, it was probably tribal entertainment originally. But now it's been fit into a cycle about northern tribes. There's a whole group of middle stories before the Deuteronomistic introduction. And the cycle starts, it starts with good, pretty good heroes, and they're doing OK. And then we get to Gideon, who doubts a lot. He's got to have like 10 tests from God to tell him it's going to be OK. And then we're going to get, we're going to get on to, um, well, that was loud. Um, um, let's see, I've got to get the order right. Oh, his son, Avimelech, who's not really, he's not really called a judge, but he's murderous. So you get the feeling, at least by the time you get to Avimelech, that, in fact, these are judges going downhill, roughly speaking. You get to Jephthah. What a great guy. He, he makes a vow, and he says, whatever come, whoever comes meet me first, or whatever comes and meets me first, I'll offer to the Lord. Happens to be his daughter. As a parent, I'm not sure that was a wise parenting move on his part. Um, and 
It's to show you that this guy has no judgment. And from, from him, so after Jephthah, then you get to Samson. And Samson is a, I love these Samson stories. It's a great cycle of stories. But you know that something's wrong because he never leads anyone in battle. Every other leader leads in battle. Sam, something's off about Samson. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a leader, it's a fighter without a force. He's not doing anything for Israel against enemies. He's hanging around with Philistine women. Life is good. So it's a, it's a, it is, there is a kind of overall, whoever puts the stories together even before the panels are written, the introductions are written, probably does have, it's not just a cyclical view of history, it's spiraling downward. Write that down. And by the time you get to the end, there's an epilogue from chapter 17 to 21. There are no judges anymore. And what happens is if the beginning of the book gives you a prologue without tribes, the, the center part, this is all on page one of your handout, gives you the stories of these tribal leaders, and they're doing these battles, and then Samson isn't. The last part in 17 to 21 ends in civil war. It's as if the book begins with battles against enemies where God helps until they do terrible things, and they, they both, we might say, they fight against their own women who are raped and killed, et cetera, and then the final story is about how they fight themselves. You say it's the battles of these great leaders, but the end of the book is showing you this is what it's all come to. Moral of the story, chapter 21, verse 25. The last verse, there was no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, which is a line in the book of Deuteronomy, the first part, which is saying, this is not good. This is not right. I know it's the beginning of a Dr. Seuss line. And it's telling you this is ultimately a great failure. So prologue, stories, epilogue. And they're different levels, but they also have a big story to tell together. And with that, I think I'll let. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, we have uh, um, some time for questions, and I think we have um, microphones. Uh, we'd, we'd like to start with the students, uh, give the students some time to give a, ask some questions. Just raise your hand, and we'll bring you the microphone. It's the beginning of the year. They're still shy. That time of year thou mayst in me behold, when yellow leaves are none or few do hang upon the boughs which shake against the cold, where ruined choirs were late the sweet birds sang. <laughs> Sorry. That's the English okay. major. Okay, I'm going to open it up to a faculty member, but students um, need to raise their hands as well. Here. Can you uh, introduce yourself to Hi, I'm Father Alan Piper. I teach theology here. It's my second year, and I'm and I'm probably a couple of weeks away from judges. Um, and cycle of sin is a big part of it, and also the the last line. Um, I didn't know that it had this um, precedent in Kings. Um, this, this is a hypothesis. Okay, okay. Uh, so my hypothesis. Yes. So I wonder what what you would think then of. Um, other discrepancies in, in Kings. So, for example, we mentioning how judges. There's this uh, downward spiral, and it's a, it's a fairly smooth uh, slope. Um, but in Kings, it's punctuated by pretty good people. Sure. So, what would you say then about the narrative arc of the series of Kings? Then, yeah. Y you know, what what is yeah. the unity of that, and how does it differ from the unity of judges? Uh, it's a great question, because Kings also has its own dynamic to some extent. What I'm proposing is something at a very broad level. That is, it's the vision that's going to include all the way from Joshua through Kings, not just within Kings itself. There are, so in historiography, depending on at what level of the text you're reading, are you just reading within a specific part? within a whole book, within a collection of books, you're going to get 
different what we might call trajectories or arcs. You know, you're reading a story. Let's say you're reading a story. It's a great story. It's got a great narrative arc. It works totally great. Then you realize, actually, it belonged to a collection of stories that this short story writer wrote. And you recognize similarities between them. They're not exactly the same. But you see something more about the arc of that first story that you read when you read that second and that third story and that fourth story. And it doesn't mean that takes away totally from the arc of that one by itself. So there's multiple levels of understanding going on. There's no doubt that what Kings wants you to do, and they're very explicit about this, is that, there, first of all, there are very few good kings, per se. I, I think that after David, Solomon's not doing so hot, even if we remember him as pretty good. Uh, and um, actually, David's interesting, too, because actually, I think there's like three different Davids in the books of Samuel and, and, and Kings. Like there's the, the young, devoted, you know, the kid who, who plays the beautiful music. It's David the shepherd boy. What a lovely kid. And then there's that dynamic, charismatic political leader. And then at the end of his life, you get to the end of his life, and you get to 1 Kings. And he says, 1 Kings chapter 1. And he says, he says, he calls Solomon in, and he says, and he gives him the Godfather speech. He says, you remember what he did to me? You will make his head run with blood and go down to Sha'ol. And it's, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's absolutely your job as my son is to avenge me for every thing that I perceive was done bad to me. And you're going to do it because that's what a good son does. These are three very different Davids. OK, who are the good kings in, in Kings? The first is Hezekiah. Um, and you're getting pretty late in Kings. I mean, you get, you get to Hezekiah, and you're down in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19. So that means you've had all of the book of Kings after David, and there's no unsullied king in the entirety of 1 Kings, if I remember correctly. There's a couple. Maybe Jehoshaphat's not so bad. Um, so there, there's little complications there. But the unvarnished, the two kings that stand out after David as being totally terrific from the point of view of that historian, Hezekiah, 2 Kings 18, 19, so. And then Josiah, 2 Kings 22, 23. And they are sort of the embodiment of what that Deuteronomic, that Deuteronomy vision, religious vision, was supposed to be about. And after them, there's only two more chapters in Kings, Second Kings, that's 24 and 25, and it's a total bust. The whole thing goes to hell, literally. Babylonians are going to show up and destroy Jerusalem and the temple. And they're going to haul those kings away, and they're going to do some nasty stuff to them. So it's true that, so part of it is to say there's an overarching negative arc that's looking toward Jerusalem. There is within that an overarching, but not as overarching, sort of within it, included within it, a positive note being sounded, the note of hope in figures like Hezekiah and Josiah. In fact, they even say, I'm not going to punish Israel in the time of Josiah because he's so good. I'm going to put it off for later. So the, these two arcs are related to one another within the construction of the end of the book. So I take your point totally. Um, I also view, you know, within the book, within a group of books, within this large group of books, you've got different levels of arcs going on, I would say. Uh, are you a student? Any students first? Didn't that sound good? Students first. Bam. No, sorry about that. I didn't mean to put you off. I know, a little left. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? I'm pretty good. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> you survive okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Good. good. Not everybody does. <laughs> yeah. Um, my name is Sarah, and uh, it's a very basic question, but 
why why judges out of all the other books in the Old Testament? You mean why have them there? No, <laughs> I mean why why did you choose judges to oh, be your main focus? Oh, out I of love your question. Especially since so many books seem to be so interrelated. Okay. Why, why did you I know this will that? sound funny, but this is absolutely true. I love my wife. Now, what does that mean? Well, I mean, you know what that means, but what has it got to do with your question? I actually never really saw myself as someone who was going to write biblical commentary. Now, I know what it means to write commentary. I actually have written two volumes of commentary on non-biblical books which hardly any Bible professor does. They do them on Bible, they don't write them about non-Bible, but I have, because it's a, another area that I work on. And commentary work is really, really hard to do well. well it's not hard to write a so-so commentary, but it is hard to write a really good commentary. And 10 years ago, now it's gonna be 10 in a few months, uh, my wife and I were approached by um, a commentary series, a good friend of mine and my wife and your associate dean, are you dean, associate dean? Also a very good friend of our dean here, who as a member of this board asked my wife and me, because my wife is a first class archeologist of Bible in ancient Israel. And she's smart. She's really smart. You know the line in, in Little Nicky? When, when uh, what's her name is explaining how smart God is? She's an angel. No? Nobody, oh, out of date, sorry. But she says, she's trying to explain to poor Little Nicky. He's played by Adam Sandler. She says, God's really smart. Liz is really smart, really smart, and knows a lot. So Sydney, my friend who's on this commentary series board, asked if the two of us together would like to write this commentary. And that the idea of working on a commentary with my wife is what totally moved me to do it. And there's more to that story than just that, but I think that's probably enough of an answer for now. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. Hi. I was just wondering what you would say if someone asked, you know, if you had to persuade, if you had to give an argument to a modern person or even a modern Christian why they should care about or even love the book of Judges, what would you, how would you try to explain it to them or sell it to them? Well, you know, it, it partially depends on what background do they come from. You know, every person ha is kind of in their own situation. They're situated. And there are certain, they have different values. So you've actually asked me about possibly, potentially, two extremely different categories of people, a Christian, and the other person was a modern person. I'm not gonna ask anything, anyone other than a modern person, by the way, although I'd like to be able to. Um, so if they're a Christian, I might, the easy answer, which isn't going to convince a lot of people, is it's in the Bible. And, you know, one of the things I don't like about, especially Christians who say the Bible's important to me, but they pick and choose, which I think is not quite what Christians ought to be doing when it comes to the Bible. I'm not saying, I'm not telling them what to do you know, take away from it exactly. I'm not, that's not the piece. I'm just sort of saying that is an argument for Christians who think they're serious about the Bible. Okay. I think for both Christians and non-Christians, the Bible is an immense, and again, on different levels of the text, it's an immense statement about what it means to be human sex, death, violence, and all three together, sometimes, sort of. It's an immense statement of the human condition. 
and it's, it's a re there's a reason why it became a classic in ancient Israel. We might say it is a classic, certainly for ancient Israel, it was a classic piece of literature, not simply because it had this thundering divine message of obedience, but because it really spoke to what their lives were about, because their lives were deeply violent, deeply tragic, especially for women, and terrible oppression in their midst. They were attacked all through their history. I mean, we say, oh, the Assyrians finally show up in 720, and, and then the Babylonian finally. Go back to the Arameans. So this is, this is not, this is not, you know, we think, we read the Bible, we have their history, and we think, well, you have, you have wars sometimes. I actually think in the consciousness of many Israelites in the period of the monarchy, war appeared on the horizon if it wasn't already there and for an awful lot of the time. That's, that's an, that itself is worth dwelling on as a human being. What does it mean to live with that kind of imagination about your past and therefore your present? What does it mean to be human in that kind of context? And judges, I mean, just has so much to say about that. What does it mean? And don't, and this is very, I hate to think about how close to home this is. The sheer violence done even within communities, women, or how women fare, I mean, I talked, uh, in the handout you'll see I say this, I talked primarily about this trajectory downward, about how men, leaders do, but how women fare at the hands of men is no less a barometer of how awful things are. That's not so far from home right now. And, and you know, looking historically, we're only at the beginning of dealing with this. The judges has a lot to say, I think, for people, whether they're Christians or they're not. Paul Gunder, of Theology Department. Hi. Uh, the judges provided military leadership for God's chosen people. Right. Did they also, or were they intended to provide religious leadership? Well, um, no. That is, let me rephrase. There is no statement, as there is for Moses or Joshua, that they are providing for such. They do know what Moses has said, according to the prologue. They, they, the, they'll use this sort of citation formulary. So it isn't that they, they, they are supposed to know what they're to do, but they don't have a particular series of figures who are doing it. The closest that we get is Deborah. Now, Deborah is the only figure who is called by name, a prophet who's functioning and significant. There is a one unnamed prophet in the book. It's another piece of the story. She is not doing prophecy, though, in the stories. That's her status as she goes into the story. There actually is one line that is used in chapter 4 around verse 7. It's 6 or 7. I'm not quite sure. I don't quite remember. Where she says, God has charged you, speaking to Barak, the general who's going to lead the Israelites, as if to say she knows it because she's a prophet. So there's an implication. But about teaching religiously, there is no indication that she's teaching religiously. And there, for many commentators, there's a kind of um, assumption somehow of failure, but not on God's part, it's somehow on Israel's part, that we, they don't have this, it's a sign of how bad the situation is. It's even taken to be a sign implicitly that they're disobedient, which we're told explicitly in chapter 2. But that implication of disobedience for many scholars even goes back to chapter 1. And maybe that's true. But the basic answer is no. I mean, I'm not sure that if I was in 
Catholic school or in CCD. I'd like Samson as my teacher. So just to, to you know, overstate the point, these figures are not really religious figures. That I mean, Surely Deborah is different. She's actually not the leader in the battle, too. It's interesting. Barak has that side, of, even though she's the one who the word judge is associated with. Even the word judge. Because some people say, well, if they're judge, that's leadership. And that has to do with justice and morality. There's a little problem there. If you go to many translations of the word for judge, actually they don't translate a judge in some translations. They'll translate something like chieftain or leader. And it's because that very word in Hebrew, it's a Hebrew problem. The Hebrew word really means to exercise authority. And that can be a legal judge or it can be a military leader. And so sometimes that word judge can sort of maybe lead you toward that kind of thinking that maybe that's what's supposed to be going on, but somehow it's not there and that's a terrible sign. And half of that might be true, but I don't think that our writers are giving a view that what, was it, what happened was, you know, they're supposed to be giving religious instruction and, that, and the Israelites are failing to do that, et cetera. But there is an assumption of religious failure there, that they should know better, et cetera. That piece of the question, in a sense, is true. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that very engaging uh, talk. This is a little bit of a related question, but you mentioned the two themes of salvation and redemption, and you um, associated salvation very much to military salvation. Right. That's and with that particular root, Yasha and Moshia. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. So I was just going to ask if you wouldn't mind just expanding a little bit on that in relation to the rest of the Hebrew Bible. I know that's a big topic, but... but um, the way it is um, conveyed in judges, and then the notion of military leader associated with salvation, and you know, to up the ante, uh, the notion of Messiah or Mashiach right. in, in the Hebrew Bible. If you could just expand a little bit on that. <laughs> how could how could one not? Since there's only a gazillion books been written on the topic. Okay, so let's go back to my first point of starting, which is each of these terms has a certain background to them based in society or nature. Remember that? Right. So the same is true of the word Messiah. Literally, the word Messiah is, oh, you're going to love this. Don't you love grammar in English? It's a passive participle. So you have the infinitive to eat, eaten is the passive participle of eat, right? Messiah comes from a root that means to anoint. Passive participle, anointed. The Messiah is the anointed one. What's the social context that it comes out of? Kings are anointed when they become kings at their coronation. Because oil, you get anointed with oil. Oil anointing in that kind of social and political context is to mark, it's a ritualistic sort of way of marking a change and elevation of status. That's what anointing signifies. It's, it's like the body language. You're like, you can do it with words. You are my son. This day I have begotten you, God says to the king in Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. You can do it with words. You can do it with body language. You can do it with gestures. So anointing with oil is a kind of gesture behavior that is a statement. It's a language that proclaims, this is our king. He's elevated in status. OK? So that's what Messiah means. And you may want to know, I don't know, you know where, I mean, so let's, let's talk about Jesus Christ. Jesus' name, the first is actually from the root that I talked about before, according to many scholars, the word for savior. Jesus is my savior. That's what his name means. And it actually is the same name as Joshua. Joshua is just a different form of the same name as Jesus. The second part of what we might say sounds like a name, Christ, 
is actually not a name, but a title. He is, Christ is the Greek translation of Mashiach, which means he is the anointed one, Christos. So Christ is a translation of the Hebrew. The word in English, Messiah, is like a writing out in English of the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is Mashiach, and you can hear it in English, Messiah sounds a lot like it. And the difference is, is because the Greek got in between. The transliteration in Greek, Messias, gets in between. You go from Mashiach to Messias to English Messiah. So your question get, is, is central to who is Jesus Christ for Christians. So what you see then is that for Christians, in a manner of speaking, Jesus becomes the location of the positive acts of God across the Hebrew Bible for the Christian community. Whether Jesus is your Redeemer, Jesus is your Messiah, Jesus is your Savior, all of that wonderful terminology that's come from different experiences of life that were at some point attributed to God, that those great deeds, we might say, of God, to use a biblical expression, are for Christians located in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you might say, then, that at that level, if the language of the Hebrew Bible is moving from, in a sense, the human to the divine, right? It starts in society or perhaps in nature, and then is attributed, is understood by analogy to God, which itself is a kind of an interesting question, how that all works. We might say that there's yet a further analogy that's when all of the same language is applied to the person of Jesus Christ. And it's also ultimately a way of saying in, for the New Testament that Jesus Christ is God because he is for the Christian community in all those, at least through those appellations, those titles, those words, is and does all the things that God did for Israel. That's my short answer. Two, two last questions. Um, okay. uh, Dr. Ford, and then we have one. No, not one from a student? You sure? OK, then we'll just take one. Dr. Ford, you're last. Uh, um, I think I was told once that th these books are listed in the prophets Ooh. in the uh, Old Testament, in the Jewish viewpoint. Yes. That these are the former prophets. Yes. So I'm wondering why you stayed away from that when you were time. talking about this. No, no, just time. I love that. I struggled. So, so the question basically comes down to, Christian tradition sort of regards these books as, as historical books, the historical writings or books. In the Jewish canon, they come before what Christians regard as the prophetic books. They come before Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, etc. They're called, and because they're later, those prophets are later in the Jewish canon, they're actually called the latter prophets. And Joshua, Judges, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings are called the former prophets. Now, you might ask this question, what makes, is there actually anything in the book that even makes them prophets? So I'm glad you asked that question. In the second temple period, in the post-exilic period, in the later biblical books, we actually see the interpretation of Judges as more of a prophetic book. So if you read chapter 9 of Nehemiah, you know, it's one of those books we all read all the time. Nehemiah, it's almost right up there with Leviticus for some people. Um, when Nehemiah retells the whole story of the judges, and they're telling what we might call, what people used to call the salvation history, kind of a recollection of all these. And twice, when they get to the book of Judges, this is a quote referring to God. 
You bore with them for many years and admonished them by your spirit through your prophets. But they would not give ear, so you delivered them into the power of the peoples of the land. Now they're explicitly evoking the period of the judges. Who all these prophets were in the book of Judges, but Nehemiah, and it actually says the phrase twice through your prophets, not just once. So as it's being received through the biblical period already, it's being interpreted as a prophetic work. But there's more. When you read in the immediate post-biblical Jewish sources, so there's a, there's a Jewish translation of uh, much of the Bible. It's called a Targum in Aramaic, Jewish Aramaic. And in the Targum for the book of Judges, the Targum interprets several of the angels in Judges as prophets because they sometimes use the same word, messenger. And so you can see how they could do that. The spirit of prophecy is mentioned three times in the translation of the poem in Judges 5 about Deborah, but it's never actually used in the biblical text. They're interpreting her even as, well, we already knew she was a prophet from chapter 4, but chapter 5 wants to tell you three more times. There's another biblical, uh, not biblical, there's another famous Jewish source around the time of the New Testament, a figure named Josephus. We talk a lot about Josephus, but a very prolific figure. And he has a whole retelling of the Bible. And in his retelling of the Bible, he mentions that he, he refers to oracles in the book of Judges that do not appear actually in the book itself. He makes it more prophetic, just as the Targum does. The dream that Gideon overhears being retold by the enemy Midianites in the Midianite camp in chapter 7, verse 14, is, it's just called a dream in the Bible, but in Josephus it's called a vision. And for reasons that still escape me, in Josephus' work, who is called a prophet? None other than Samson himself. Now, this view that uh, it, could be, it could be more of a prophetic book, it's also, it's, it's, it depends on what you mean by prophecy also. That is, we think, if you ask many people, well, what does it mean to be a, prophet, to be a prophet? Half the people in the room might tell you that it means someone who can tell the future, which is not completely a biblical view. There are plenty of prophets who do tell the future in the Bible, but their, but their job is as much to talk about the present. And to they are deliverers of God's word to the people. That's what a prophet is, not a fortune teller. Fortune telling, we might say, is also functions not simply to tell the future, but to serve as warning, to get people to change their minds. And that's the whole story of the book of Jonah, who doesn't want to be a prophet. And God gets him to be a prophet. And then he tells the word that God tells him. And because they repent, God changes his mind. And he forgives them. So Nineveh is not destroyed. And Jonah is ticked off. You made me go there, and I did what you, you told me to do, and then you change. How can you do that? So fortune telling itself is not the primary thing. It's part of the bigger picture. Delivery of God's word to the people. So some people, so talking about how Judges is a prophetic book, there are different ways of thinking about that, that I'm still, th I don't have it nailed down yet. I think that, so, so you have one or two figures, you've got, you know, the problem of, following God's covenant, but you don't really have, you only have these two figures who would even begin to fit the bill. But at the same time, there are things in the book that make me think that it has a kind of prophetic dimension to it. One, and this is not what everybody else would say, but it's certainly, I did mention before, I think that judges gestures toward the kings. And so it's very much forward looking. And even though I'm not big on fortune telling as the 
criterion, I, maybe that's a dimension of that story. You know, it, 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 you, we could talk a lot more about what does it mean to be a prophet that, that the book itself, not the figures in it, is the prophetic message and function. It tells Israel, ultimately, what its past was about so they know what to do in the present and the future. And I mean, the other, I mean, part of this question goes to the heart of there are other books where prophets are much more prominent, for example, in Kings. Someone has layered in consistently a series of prophets in the books of Kings in a way that where that label fits. So some labels fit better than others, uh, fit different books better than others on that score of formal prophets. But I still, I'm still thinking a lot about this. And I just started thinking about this like two weeks ago. I don't know why, but I've never seen a good answer to that question. And, and you know, there's probably some out there. Um, I mean, I know some other people who work hard on Judges, too, and they might have answers to that question. Well, thank you very much. Um, this very interesting and thought-provoking at the beginning of the semester. We have a lot to think about. Um, please join us uh, in the Ruane um, uh, uh, the entrance hall. there, the Great Hall, um, for a reception if you can. Uh, hang around. There's plenty of food. Um, and you can speak with our speaker. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>